Of course, I'm a gastroenterologist. I have to show the GI tract. So you saw this from Banked, but there it is. It is, um, it's a very long tube. It's got an, uh, an entry, it's got an exit. And whatever is in the lumen, as was said earlier, is really outside us, not inside us. When we compare it to our, the rest of our surfaces, um, our gut mucosa, those 300 square meters or equivalent to the tennis court uh, surface, are huge. And on the one side of that, of that membrane, which is less than a fraction of a tenth of a millimeter, which is the gut epithelium, on one side you've got billions to trillions of microbes, on the other side you have almost none. What really protects us, what really separates us from the environment is our immune system. And this tightly regulated mucosal immunity is absolutely necessary not only to maintain health, but certainly to maintain survival. Which, of course, um, teleologically we can argue as to that why, that's why it makes sense that 80% of all immune active cells of the body are, are gut-associated lymphoid tissue. Most of our, that when you combine all our T cells or our B cells, all our macrophages, they're not in the liver, they're not in the spleen. The major, vast majority of them occur associated to gut mucosa because that's by far the biggest surface of exposure to our environment and the one exposed to this huge microbiome which is the uh, gut bacteria. It's the GALT which is the largest immune organ. Animals raised in a germ-free environment are going to have an intestinal epithelium, which is extremely um, uh, incompetent in separating ourselves from that microbial environment which is in the gut. Uh, conventionally reared animals in a non-sterile normal environment are going to have a better cell enzyme activity of the epithelium, the mucosal turnover will be higher, the cellularity of the villi will be bigger, the gut um, mucosa itself will be thicker and significantly uh, more functional and a better barrier than the gut mucosa of an animal that's reared in a completely germ-free environment where it becomes in fact a trophic and of course facilitates uh, the chances for any kind of invader, in this case whether bacterial including viral, to be able to do damage to the host. Um, a healthy flora is critical to train that immune system and maintain uh, this function. Any bacterium is going to stimulate the gut to secrete mucus, secrete mucin. It's going to enhance gut permeability so that it increases the chances that, or decreases the chances that we have passage of uh, antigens and or other microbes. It increases uh, particularly secretory um, uh, uh, immune uh, function, particularly uh, gut IgA secret secretion, and as we'll talk, it does help balance T helper function cells. This is an oversimplification of what and how mucosal T cells as part of gut-associated lymphoid tissue can react. So at the top you have the epithelium, this barrier, um, which is in intimate contact with all other immune cells that are present as part of our gut-associated lymphoid tissue, immediately below uh, the villi or in the villi and as part of the, um, uh, the lamina propria. On the one side of that epithelium, you have antigens and microbes. On the other hand, you have this immune active tissue, which needs to be modulated. Immune active tissue requires a stimulus to react. And most of these cells, and again, I'm oversimplifying, but through a number of mechanisms that we're better understanding today, whether it's through antigen presenting cells or whether it's the toll receptors, uh, the number of mechanisms that we now call or are part of this bacterial and epithelial crosstalk, they will modulate the response of these T cells into you know, groups that we generally categorize Th type, Th1 type of, uh, or T helper cell, or Th2, and increasingly we better understand what the, the function of T regulatory cells, which in fact serve to be a balance between these two responses. Most of, all of these, of course, are absolutely necessary for health, also necessary for survival, so that we can uh, appropriately react to the outside environment, uh, whether it's Th1 and their uh, very significant function on cellular immunity or whether it's TH2 and their significant function on humoral immunity and the increasing concept 
that what we actually need is not lack of antigens, but presentation or adequate presentation and timing of antigens to induce immune tolerance in where the T regulatory cells play a very significant role. This is the normal immune response that we expect in any host who's eating normal and being exposed to a very rich external microbial environment. Unfortunately, there are also dysfunctions and exaggerated responses of both Th1 and Th2 uh, types of, uh, uh, of cells, which actually lead to many of the diseases that today we are, we are seeing uh, are drastically increasing and are part of this mo modern society. Most of them are uh, overexpression of one or other type of immune response, whether it's autoimmunity, such as in Crohn's disease, and we have you know, elevated Th1 um, uh, activity, or allergy, such as Th2 um, uh, overexpression. Uh, if you look at this from the secular point of view in terms of what the secular trend has been in the last just 50 years of human existence here in, in, on Earth, we've done a great job eliminating streptococcal disease, like you know, rheumatic fever, viral disease like hepatitis, mycobacterial disease like tuberculosis. Um, we've done a remarkable job at getting rid of many of these, not only through our environmental sanitation, but also through you know, programs such as vaccination. But if, if you look at them, there, it's almost a mirror image of the trend or the speed with which autoimmune disease, both Th1, like Crohn's, or the red, the red line, which is Th2, allergic diseases have been increasing. So we are paying a price, at least there's a very clear association, between the changes that we see today in our exposure to microbes, not just the reduction of diseases, but all the sanitation that comes with these and the increase in these autoimmune or lack of adequate immune regulatory uh, conditions. And here's where the microflora plays a very significant role in not only stimulating adequate immune response, but maintaining this adequate balance so that we have less chances for overexpression of immunity and these diseases. Uh, each one of the areas where we have introduced and modified the way that we have or uh, uh, get or uh, have delivered a microbial uh, uh, exposure particularly in the first parts of life. But C-section, sterile formulas, nat poor use or lack of use of naturally fermented foods, cleaning everything. And unfortunately, the cleaning you know, does, uh, it, it does continue throughout the life of an infant. It's not only birth by C-section, it's not the common use of antibiotics, which wreaks havoc in the intestinal flora, um, but even when children need to be exposed to other children. Today, daycare is not the same as it was 15 or 20 years ago. In daycares today, and when children go, you know, the, the, the sanitation is quite extreme. The, the spray is used on the toys, on the surfaces. The kids are sprayed. Everybody's sprayed. <laughs> so that ultimately, uh, the exposure of children, even in daycare centers today, is not what it was just a decade ago. Now, the good thing, of course, we got rid of pathogens, and we may be decreasing some viral illness associated to it. But we're also paying a price from the point of view of immunologic experience in those, in, uh, in, in those infants. This, which leads to this change in microbial exposure, changes in the microbiota that you heard about earlier, and changes in immune response.